So I wanted to say thank you very much for, um, for you know, getting in touch with me and, and including me in this discussion because it's been very interesting with Jonathan Pajot. And oh yeah, for sure. Not, Paul Van Der Clay and, and yeah. everything that's been going on. It's just been really wonderful. It's been quite an experience and quite a mind expanding experience. And I think that I was drawn to your work in particular because, um, you know, as a, as a therapist, I, I guess I like to say I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of interested in the transformative arts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, which which is sort of yep for sure because in in the therapeutic community you know there's not much there's not much emphasis on spirituality and i think that that's a factor that's really missing i agree I and agree. and it makes people it makes it very difficult for people to transcend let's just say self-transcend because they're kind of stuck on one level very much so what i like so much about your work is that you're doing the the research you know in-depth research and then you're also uh, suggesting practices and showing how those practices can really help with the science to back it up. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, very much. I think you're right. I think therapy is a prototypical example of an instance uh, of what, you know, where people are seeking for what Ellie Paul calls a transformative experience. And I, I, I'm, it's no coincidence that when I was talking about the Gnosis and existential mm -hmm. entrapment, I invoked a therapeutic context. I think that's very apropos. Um, and so part of what I've been trying to do uh, is to try and find a way to bring back a discussion and a, a, a remembrance, a modal, sati yeah. remembrance of the, the kind of knowing in which transformation plays a pivotal and essential role, the, what I call participatory knowing. And, um, and I think that's uh, something central to addressing the meaning crisis. Um, and then I happen to think and argue that that kind of knowing and its attendant processes like insight and, 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 and altered states of consciousness uh, can be well explained with, uh, you know, 4E cognitive science, relevance, realization, machinery. And that's my attempt to wed um, promoting a deep remembrance of the practices of participatory transformation to a scientific worldview and thereby address, um, I think, sort of key components of the meaning crisis. Yeah, so, so I, th I, th I think that's, I think what you've said is, is, yeah. is accurate. Thank you. Well, I think it, I think that makes a lot of sense because I think where we are now, you know, in the 21st century, I mean, Pearson wrote Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is mostly um, what I've been uh, going through for this talk. You know, he has the second book, Lila, which, which, mm -hmm. which really kind of, um, makes the metaphysics of quality a real theory. And this right, is right. sort of a, an exploration of that leading up to Lila. But I think that, you know, even in, in Lila was written in 91. And um, so this was published in 74, I believe. And, you know, the, the uh, neuroscience just wasn't where it is now. I mean, I think there was, there's an explosion in the late nineties is my understanding. And then, then we're kind of, is, is that right, would you say? Well, cognitive science sort of takes off in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and then cognitive science um, starts to be fundamentally changed in the 90s by the advent, or the, the late 80s, early 90s, by the advent of neural networks. Mm -hmm. With neural networks, uh, dynamical systems start to come in, and then the whole embodiment, and that's sort of the late 90s. And about that time, uh, uh, brain plasticity starts to come to the fore, and neuroscience starts to become much more inherently developed developmental and trying to understand the functionality of the brain and so these all of these three things that en emphasize sort of self-organization self-design uh dynamical systems they all sort of start to gel together and talk together towards uh the beginning of the millennium and then that just picks up steam thereafter yeah so so i think that where we are now you know there's just no way to ignore that so, oh i agree i agree yeah, so and i don't think anyone at this point is really going to take like a, a like a theory of trans uh, transformation seriously without the scientific backing. I don't think there's really. I, I would hope so, Savilla. I would hope yeah. so. I mean, I I do worry about these two currents of uh, of avoidance, which are mm -hmm. sort of a, a nostalgic uh, drift. Or yeah. People want to somehow go back before all of this, um, which I agree with you. I think mm -hmm. the genie's out of the bottle, and the genie's out of the bottle, as I've tried to say 
recently in some of my Q and A's, you know, the advent of AGI and how it's going to enmesh yeah. uh, with, with cognitive science and neuroscience. Yeah. It, it is, it's, it's going to have an impact on our understanding of ourselves and spirituality and transformation yeah. that's going to make Darwin and Copernicus look like kindergarten. Uh, it, it's just coming. One of the few people who's paid attention to that is John Hicks, uh, mm -hmm. a really important theologian who he really wrestles with the advent of this upcoming expansion in neuroscience. Uh, I have, other than him, I haven't seen a lot of people doing it. I'm also worried about people who sort of escape into a philosophical, utopic yeah. way of, uh, of thinking. It. And, yeah. and Neither one of those, I think, really wrestles with what you're saying. Well, we have to find a way of resituating the practices by which people deal with perennial problems mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scientific worldview. I'm not, you know this, I'm not anti-religious. I, I, I'm willing yeah, yeah. to, yeah, I'm willing to yeah. very much enter into discussion in good faith, uh, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> in good faith uh, with people who mm -hmm. like, Paul or Jonathan are also willing to enter into a discussion. If, yeah. like, like I said, I see them trying to bring about significant revision and Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do think that the, any, any religious attempt or a utopic attempt to say, let's sort of ignore the science. Um, I, 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 it's, it's, it's just to ignore how successful and pervasive and powerful science and technology in the scientific worldview are. So I, I think I, I am in deep agreement with you that we need to, we need to keep our, 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 our feet in both of these worlds, the world of spirituality and the world of science. I, I agree with you. And, um, and, you know, if you're talking about transcendence being a pattern, you know, self-transcendence, mm -hmm. I mean, we culturally, we just as a world, even as a world culture have transcended to this, you know, to this mm -hmm. level and going back just, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, yeah, it would just be, it would be like a, um, it would be an ideological move. And I, and I, I think that's totally right. And I think what, what it, it's an ideological move that's, in a sense, self-deceptive, because and I'm sure Paul could explain this much mm -hmm. better than I, but I tried to do a bit in the series. Religious thinking has not been taking place in a vacuum since the scientific revolution. It has redesigned itself and adopted the forms and the terms and the goals and tried to pattern itself on science. And so a lot of people to think what they're defending when they're defending their current religious framework, they're sort of defending something before they're not. Right, like it's deeply enmeshed, mm -hmm. uh, all it's with, for centuries with the with the scientific worldview, and so the attempt to do that is ultimately self defeating because the the, the whole Cartesian way of thinking is deeply interwoven uh, with a lot of current uh, a lot of current theology. Uh, yeah, from a Christian perspective, I would say. Yeah, so, I, yeah, deeply interwoven in everything. You know, pretty much where we are. I yes, mean, you yes. know, we're, and this is what we're trying to transcend, I think, in a yes. lot of ways. I agree. I agree. So, again, uh, I, and I try to get at that by trying to get at sort of the fundamental axial revolution grammar mm -hmm. and, and how we need to really understand it very deeply and then try to jazz our way out of it. Um, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. And, and yeah. as, as you've noted, I'm trying to do it not only in what I'm te talking about and teaching people. Uh, I'm trying to do it in, in the manner of which I'm trying uh, of discourse and dialectic. Mm -hmm. And also uh, trying to facilitate people like yourself and others who are in good faith working to try and, you know, explore and articulate all of this um, with you know, authenticity and insight. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's all three of those have to be carried out in a deeply integrated manner. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's, and it's very interesting the way that, you know, we're kind of all articulating the same problem in different ways, depending yes. on, you know, what, what our level of understanding of it is, what our level of education is, what discipline we're coming at it from. It's just, but, but the core message seems to be very similar. Yeah. I'm, so one of the, one of the, I think this is the right word. One of the advantages I have as a cognitive scientist is it's, I'm inherently interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's great. Um, so I'm not, I'm not claiming I've succeeded mm -hmm. in this or anything, but my endeavor was to try and provide as, you know, as comprehensive 
a, a, a kind of vocabulary and theoretical grammar that many different people could come to and use by digging in as deeply as I could in this interdisciplinary fashion into the axial age um, uh, grammar. And so that's, and, and what has been one of the most satisfying achievements, I guess, for my work has been that many people have said that this vocabulary, they find it useful and a useful way of articulating and developing their own thought. And that's, that's tremendously important. That's tremendously important. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we're, that, uh, well, Paul articulated this, and I've certainly noticed it, is the, the grammar that you're, you know, putting forth is really useful. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of these terms, you know, I think I, I would continue to use, um, you know, as I, as I try to sort through this myself, because some of them really are good. Good. That's good. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's tools before rules, right? You, you, yeah. want, to give, <laughs> you want to give people very valuable yeah. tools that they can use rather than just giving yeah. them rules for what they should believe or think. Yeah. yeah and I think, I think this grammar that you're developing is, is, is are very good tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like what you're trying to do. Um, I mean, I like what you're trying to do independently, like mm -hmm. the, the work you're trying to do about uh, bringing Persic out mm -hmm. as, I mean, I would call him, I, I, you know, he's one of the prophets of the meaning crisis. Yes. He's clear. Yeah. The book begins with the invocation of yes. the meaning crisis and he, and he keeps bringing it up when he's talking about what, uh, John and, is it John and Susan? And John and Sylvia. Yeah. John and Sylvia, and they're, they're clearly uh, mm -hmm. suffering. Uh, John and Susan are my examples. I always <laughs> John yeah, and you Sylvia. Susan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you know, when he's, when he's de describing their, an their antipathy towards mm -hmm. technology, but there's something deeper going on. I mean, so the book, uh, and, and you're right, I think, um, I, I think you're right that what he's wrestling with and, and, the, and the fact that he's using the novel now, this, he won't like this. Maybe he would. Have. I mean, it's a very platonic thing. He's actually using a mm -hmm. dramatic dialogic form rather than a treatise uh, to present. Mm -hmm. Exactly. To, to present uh, yeah. because he's, he's concerned, as we've articulated, with not just presenting a theory, but with exemplifying a way of life that is a response. And I think Absolutely. So I, I see that really clearly. And I think mm -hmm. you picked up on that very insightfully. And you're and you're out there, right? And you're and you're you're trying to say look, you're trying to you know make this more and more accessible um, and, and um, viable to people. I think that's really commendable. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And that's um, that you know. And and again, that's one of the reasons I'm drawn to your work is because I see in your work a way because because there's so many. I, I mean, I think we'll get to this in a second. There are so many sim similarities. Yes, there's a lot be, of similarities. you know between what you're doing and what he was doing. And so, because, because the similarities are so prevalent, you know, and you are actually trying to practice in the world and, and you know, uh, awake, awaken from the meaning crisis and make us, you know, better individually and make the world individually ultimately is what we're, I guess, trying to do. It sounds Good, realistic. let's just say. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, how are you going to do it with, without, you know, really restructuring your framework of how you see reality, you know? And oh, I, totally. And I think, yeah. so, and I think, and part of what I'm trying to get back to is that restructuring your framework is not mm -hmm. something you can just do propositionally. That's right. That's I mean, right. Propositionals, proposition and propositional inferential mm -hmm. thinking yeah. is going to play a role, but that transformation is ultimately not just a theoretical restructuring. That's it is a right. much, it's a much more profound kind of restructuring. Mm -hmm. And again, he's pointing to that. Yeah, I was drawn to your work. Well, you know who he is now, because I think you've seen one of the discussions I had with him. My co-author, Christopher Master Pietro, uh, we did the discussion on the zombies and on the symptomology of the meaning crisis. He actually came to me and said, you know, you should, he gave me uh, my copy of, of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, because he said, you should read this because I think Persic, when Persic is talking about quality, he's talking about something very similar to what you're talking when you're talking about relevance realization. And so that's how I, and then I, I was interested in that. That was real, that was like in my mind, and then you did the thing on my work and flow, and I, oh, wow, wow, yeah. and that, you know, um, if I was a Jungian, I'd say it was synchronicity or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so that's how I got drawn to your work, and then, you know, I keep, I, 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 and then I saw, right, um, I, and I love your phrase for this, our corner of the internet. Mm -hmm. I, I really cherish that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's. It's, it's, it, it connotes this sort of community, yeah. uh, you know, um, and, 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 and a lack of sort of pretense because it's a corner. We're not trying to dominate. Mm -hmm. I, li I like, I, it's just a great turn of phrase. And I noticed that in our corner of the internet, a lot of your people 
but you you're, are also people that are looking at Paul or looking at Jonathan. And, and so I thought, wow, this, I really want to, I want to see what's going on here. Yes, and I think this group is sort of d wrestling with with spirituality kind of the same way I am, you know, which Very way much. are we going to go, and do we even need to pick? I mean, is there something beyond, you know, and I, I guess so, that's a whole um, different discussion. Well, but, maybe it'll come up in what we want to talk about, because mm -hmm. I mean, I've really valued, and I think Paul did too, the discussion you had with Paul about this, uh, because... One of the things I like about Paul, and he, he has to, he sort of struggles with, I think, some of his audience about this, is he's very open to mm -hmm. treating uh, people like yourself um, who, you did this once. <laughs> like, you, I, I, I'm kind of in, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the gesture ca captures it really perfectly. Um, you know, you're, you're not, you, you see value in sort of uh, traditional Christianity and theism but you also have criticisms and then you're trying, you see an independent value in Persic, which is, and he's clearly not coming from uh, a Christian framework. Um, and, and so um, you're, you're wrestling about how do I do due diligence and treat all of these different things justly. And I think people who wrestle with that honestly, as I see you doing it, and in the face of the meeting crisis, those are the people I really want to talk to. Those are the people I really want to talk to. Generally, the people that have, you know, are convinced, you know, like I say about nostalgia or utopia mm -hmm. or nihilism. Uh, there's oh, yeah. nothing. There's nothing to talk to them about. Um, or materialism. Well, I want to talk to you about that because <laughs> I, 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 I have, I, I, maybe I don't know. Maybe that's a good place to start because mm -hmm. maybe that will get us in because I understand how you're using that term and I understand what you're criticizing. Mm -hmm. But so I, I, uh, I consistently describe myself as a physicalist. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so a physicalist is, uh, I, and, and, and people keep wanting to not hear the distinction I make because a physicalist thinks that all of reality is in some sense consistent with physics, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and not physics as it is now, but physics as it will, as it, as it will continue to, to go. So physics license that a lot of things are intellectually possible right now because of our current physics so mm -hmm. it's not just limited to what physics currently has and, and, and one more thing and 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 right many people are non-reductive physicalists we think that there are real relations real patterns real levels in that sense of existence that yeah. like act as constraining features on reality in ways that aren't reducible just to matter. Many things exist that don't have the property of being material objects. One of my favorite, evolution is not, in, is not located in a specific time or place mm -hmm. or even in a specific chemical, right? It's multiply realizable in many situations, many different, right? But it's real. If I were to deny that evolution is real, I lose an explanation that's consistent with physics of how we got here. So my ontology includes the reality of evolution. It, in, it includes the reality of the patterns of information that are available to me at this macro level. Because if that information isn't real, the conclusions I'm drawing about the quantum level are also not going to ultimately be real. Mm -hmm. S see what I mean? So yeah, I see exactly what it's, you mean. It's very, very rich. And it's, it, I'm not trying to, it's most physicalists don't hold that, er, well, I, not all, mm -hmm. but most physicalists don't hold it you know, all of reality can be, you know, reduced to uh, descriptions of material objects and yeah. their spatiotemporal properties. So one of the things I, I, I want to, and I mean this question anonymous, mm -hmm. honestly, and, and not, I'm not asking it sort of in an anonymous fashion, I'm asking it personally to you, mm -hmm. right? What is it, what is it, there's a moreness, which mm -hmm. I'm really interested in, I love by the that way. Word. Yeah, there's a moreness you're pointing to, and I get this. Yeah, you're rejecting materialism, and 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 and, and, and I see that, and I see that you're not happy, or at least not happy yet, with sort of attributing that moreness to a supernatural, some kind of domain of reality that trend, that is beyond, or and thereby in some sense inconsistent with our physics, right? So what is it you're what is it you you're pointing to when you're pointing to that well i think um sorry is that a, is that an unfair question no or? no it's not an unfair question it's just I'm, I'm, uh there's a lot of ways to go with that well please so, take your time i'll, I'll be okay. quiet while, you, while you're <laughs> so i think um i think that 
I wonder if this is the right way to answer it. Let me just say, this is the first thing that comes to mind, but it might not exactly be the right way to answer it. Um, so the, a lot of the problem I've been having is, and, and I think I know which direction I'm going, but um, the, a lot of the reason I'm attracted to, to piercing is because he's described, okay, so first of all, when you're talking about um, these patterns that are real, very much so. This is what makes dynamical systems theory, so, and I don't know much about it, and I know you probably, I, I did a video a while ago that probably didn't really, um, uh, that probably wasn't really accurate, but but it's still, it, it really compels me nonetheless, because there's something about dynamical systems that that sort of describe the pattern of the structure. I think so. Yeah, that's right. You know? and, and, it, and it describes the patterns, and this is something that's very important when we get back to discussing Plato and intelligibility. It mm -hmm. discovers, it, 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 uh, it, it discusses, maybe discovers, uh, these patterns in a way in which the, yeah. the development, the structure, the function, and the development are all totally intermeshed. You cannot separate them out. It, it structures by functioning, and it functions by developing, and it develops by functioning, and it's, as it's functioning, it's structuring. And so all of these are, are deeply, deeply intermeshed. And you know, dynamical systems theory I, 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 is playing an increasingly you know, important role within um, branches of physics, branches mm -hmm. of chemistry, branches of biology. So it is it is very much consistent with physicalism in a profound way. Yeah. But it gives it gives us a way of of, of, of talking about things that I, I think are the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so again, because uh, it, it, I, I, at some point uh, Paul and I are, are scheduled to have another discussion. I want to oh, ask <laughs> what, he's, what he's pointing to. I mean, mm -hmm. he did an excellent thing on C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, and because I, I see him wanting to talk about patterns and intelligibility and, and, and you know development and transcendence and, and all of the things and I uh, and I I talk about those things too. I want yeah, yeah. And, and and I mean this and I and I'm not I really mean this question honestly. I'm not trying to be sort of, uh, you know obtuse or passive aggressive. I want to know what it is because I, I get comments from some of my viewers is yes, but you're ultimately you're missing the supernatural on it. Yeah. But I want I want to know what does this mean experientially for you? What is it you're experiencing when you say that? Because I experience you know profound mystical at one moment, I trans, self transcendence, these dynamical patterns that have emergent. I experience all of that, and I don't experience it just abstractly. I experience it in the bones of my in body. Uh, my, yeah, yeah, right. So, like, I, 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 what is it? What is it you're you're experiencing that I'm not? And if you're it, right, and and that's what it comes down to. Because if you just if you're pointing to an idea like we talked about before mm -hmm. that can't get into my experience in a transformative manner then I don't care about it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care about it because in my, it, I don't, it's not going to be an answer to the meaning crisis. I think we both agree Please. that deep transformation is needed. And if you have, if you're pointing to something that can't come into me through transformative experience, then I, 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 I don't, I don't see why I should care about it. Yeah. I don't mean yeah. to dismiss it. I really don't. I want, I'm, I'm trying to be honest and open. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking you, like, what it, what is it? What is it you're pointing to? Like, what is it? Because yeah. I, 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 I mean, as the series goes on, I'm going to talk a lot more about moreness and how I think Good. we can fit that into this <laughs> picture. I'm talking too much. I'm talking too much. No, but it's it's great. No, I I <laughs> love it. So I think um, so. One big dilemma I have is is the metaphysical quality on uh, is does that produce God or does God produce the metaphysical quality? Right, right. Okay. And that is a thing that I don't know if I'll ever be able to answer. But, but what I do feel is like uh, the best analogy that I can think of right off the bat is your analogy is, is the real world, you know, the real world that you describe. Yep, yep. There is always operating in the, in the realm of your experience and the, an ability to connect with the real world. Like sometimes yes. you get entrapped in sort of, you know, whatever is going on and, uh, and the negative influence of the actual transactional world, let's just say. But if you can pull yourself out of it, you can connect to that. And that embodied feeling, which you're describing, I believe that in my own, in my own um, biological and, uh, and, and metaphysical, philosophical and religious framework, I'm feeling the same thing. In Good. Yeah. So yeah. I think what you're describing is something very similar. It's a feeling of, and, and I think this is, 
probably one of the most important words in both your uh, in, in both your work and in Pierce's work is the, is the word freedom. Yeah, it, it's a, it, uh, right. Um, it's an important kind of freedom. Um, yeah. So I don't think of freedom as an intrinsic value. Um, I think of freedom as an instrumental value. Yeah. Um, and I think there's there's aspects in which I think Persik is committed to that. Let me explain what I mean. Okay. Uh, I, I, so you should always ask free from what and free to what, right? Yeah. Freedom, uh, that's an ambiguous and, and you know, uh, thing. The project from, you know, getting freedom from self-deception, but also it's ultimately freedom to connect to like the real world, the yes. world, right? To connect more, uh, to more deeply uh, to the real patterns, let's put it that way. But it's also an understanding that it's always available. And well, I that's think part, that's, 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 no, that's no, what no, that's I mean not. by freedom. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, ah, okay. So the way I talk about that then, uh, and this is sort of deeply influenced by Taoism, yeah, and I and I'm I'm with you totally on board with you there. I think you know probably if anything is is um, is consonant with Pierce's philosophy, it's Taoism. There's something very much so. so similar there. Very very similar there. Um, yeah. And so Taoism talks about the inexhaustibleness of yeah. of the Tao, and then mm -hmm. no matter how much you use it, no matter how much you draw from it, you can never yeah um, exhaust it. Exhaust it. And I'm going to come back to this in this series, but the idea that I think that's consonant with the the work I, I'm doing on the on relevance realization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's, I, it is. Yeah. It's I mean, to me, that, it seems. Oh, good. Because yeah, yeah. the idea is that, right? We have to frame. It's indispensable. We yeah. can't do without zeroing in on relevant information. But reality is combinatorially explosive. Yes, it is. It, but and, and so we can always transframe and draw more of that inexhaustibleness into, but we can't exhaust it. So the moreness is grounded in this sort of combinatorially explosive nature of reality. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're constantly drawing from it. And I, and I think one of the arguments I'm going to make, I'm going to make in a series is when we get uh, the, the next lecture has to come out. <laughs> symbols in Jonathan Pajot's sense of a symbol, like yeah. we get these deeply inactive patterns yeah. uh, uh, of framing yes. that keep us on a trajectory of transframing. So we're constantly yeah. getting a sense of being nourished, and there, our intelligibility is constantly being nourished by the inexhaustible. Right. I think, I think the, that's. A, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And the inexhaustible is, um, is, is, cons is consistent. It's like, this is, I noticed, you know, like yeah, yeah. the pattern itself is never changing. Well, so the, the idea, yeah. So the, that's part of, that's what sort of underwrites my commitment to physicalism mm -hmm. because at what there seems to be a structuring of the possibility that actually exists in the inexhaustible aspect of reality mm -hmm. such that it doesn't come in in some sort of way that right seems un it doesn't come in in some fundamentally unintelligible chaotic fashion yeah it, 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 it ultimately gives us um it gives us something that we can i'm struggling for words here. it gives something that by through transframing can then become part of our lived experience and our lived understanding of the world. And, and what I want yeah. to say is this, that experience of, of symbols, the joining, mm -hmm. symbols, right, that join the open-endedness of my relevance realization machinery to the inexhaustibleness of reality. Yeah. So there's a constantly flowing fount of intelligibility, not yes, just absolutely. intellectually. That's for me, sacredness. Yes. That's what the experience of sacredness is. Yeah. And, and, and I use sacredness because I'm trying to not use a term that will limit me to a theistic framework mm -hmm. because Taoism is not theistic at all, yeah. but, uh, right? But there's definitely sacredness in Taoism. There's definitely- no, there absolutely is. There's and sacredness it, in the shunyata of Buddhism, right? Absolutely. And I really, um, your, your lecture number 13 was fantastic. That's one of the best characterizations of Dukkha I've ever heard. Oh, thank you. You know, thank that's you. like, um, it's, it's loss of agency. Yes, which very is, much. Which is, you know, and that's what you're talking about now is if you, if you lose that integration, you know, with you and you the environment, the you lose your agency. And so that so, gets back to the point of that, what I'm actually talking about of freedom, mm -hmm. I, I think what I'm really concerned about is agency. Yes. 
an agency isn't the same thing as freedom. I think that's sort of liberalist bullshit, right? I think, yeah, yeah. I think agency is being bound, and this is what Persik is on about, is being bound to what's good, what's true, what's yeah. beautiful, right? And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, exactly. And so the use of freedom in that regard is 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 not what we mean. What we mean is the freedom to you know you have the freedom to reconnect with that. Yes, it's exactly. available to you if you can remember it. You're remembering you know the sati. I guess you would say it is. Right. So that's what yeah. I mean when I think of freedom as ultimately yeah. an important but nevertheless an instrumental value. Freedom yeah. is for the sake of enhancing the connectedness. That's and right to our agency connecting back to these you know let's just say these patterns that are always there and that are never changing so it's not freedom of the patterns it's not you know just dis disrupting and just disrupting the patterns which are not uh, which are indestructible it's yes. the freedom to understand that you that they're there and you can connect it or not and if you don't you know you have self-deception and, and um, I think that's very well put what you just said I mean the thing to remember and I, I, I think I see this in person but maybe I'm wrong uh, at least some of the initial framing where he's talking about like when you're on the motorcycle you you don't have a frame he even uses that's right that. yeah you are in the yeah, world yeah, yeah and, you're and, you, and you're in the world with technology but you but the technology is high quality technology right right a right. well run you know well um maintained well-made motorcycle is not is the boot is in there so that to me seems like he's often invoking the platonic notion of an IDOS, right? This, uh -huh. Or logos, the structural functional organization is an important way in which quality is present. Is that a yeah. fair understanding? I think so, absolutely, because all his analogy in that book, you know, most of his analogies are about motorcycle maintenance. Right, right. And that is, you know, that integration of classic and romantic, that integration of, um, of technology and art. And right. that I think was the whole project was well, how can I unite technology and art is, is a big part of it. Right. So for me, that that seems to be analogous. I don't think it's identical, but it's analogous. I mean, because there's definitely the procedural knowing in mm -hmm. the, the motorcycle maintenance. Yeah, of course. But right. Uh, and, but there's uh, but there's also right. There's also the perspective. There's the artistic. Yeah. Right. There's the way your salience landscape is being yeah. shaped and sculpted by the Absolutely. practice. Absolutely. And then finally, there's the participatory knowing because he's being, his identity is being transformed in his interaction. With Absolutely. The so I, I saw that as a metaphor for him saying for basically, you know, the motorcycle maintenance is a spiritual practice by which mm -hmm. he activates and articulates and, you know, celebrates these levels of knowing that get us sort of fundamentally connected to reality. Is that a fair interpretation? I think that's absolutely fair. Okay, well, good then. So that means, I'm sort <laughs> yeah. of getting it. Because, you know, like a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, the gumption, for example, which is to remain, um, remain focused on your, I mean, to remain engaged, participating with your work mm -hmm. is a big concept in his, his, um, in his, uh, there, in his work, in his uh, writing. And that gumption, you know, that get up and go, that staying in that moment, that being engaged, it, it really is like the flow state. It's yeah, really. Well, yeah. that's how I came to know you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that I thought that, and then uh, I thought that was really good. And then that's so consonant with what you just said a few minutes ago yeah. about uh, like how resonant his work is with Taoism. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I, I've often it, it's a slogan, and it's 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 simplistic like all slogans, but it nevertheless points to something of a gist, right? That yeah. Taoism is the religion of flow, right? It's yeah. about the religion about trying to get you you know, into deeper flow states, deeper in both senses, a more intense personal experience, uh -huh. but also symbolically deeper. The, the flow state permeates your worldview and yeah. your way and your way of seeing everything. You, yeah. you to see things in a flowy way uh, rather than in a static way. Yeah. And everything is through, uh, is through quality, through the lens of quality in terms of being connected to that. So that's his, you know, that's his way of putting it. Sure. That you so, no, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. please. Well, so I was thinking maybe we should talk about uh, relevance, realization, and quality. And qu and quality. Well, I yeah. wanted to say, and I think this will help dovetail in it. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I wasn't trying to answer your dilemma because I think you're right in that you're going to be wrestling with it a lot. Mm -hmm. for the relationship between God and quality. Mm -hmm. um, but I've tried to, I've tried to. I hope be helpful because I've tried to, uh, I've tried to show how there's important connections well in this you know i've just indicated it mm -hmm. between sacredness and relevance realization mm -hmm. and then that perhaps you know you may that may be helpful for you in relating 
getting a clearer relationship between quality and sacredness. So I make a distinction between sacredness, which is this experience we've been talking about, you know, that the open-endedness, yeah. my relevance realization is flowing with the inexhaustibleness of reality. And then what I call the sacred, which is our metaphysical proposal as to what the cause of that is, mm -hmm. right? And, and so um, my hope is uh, that by making this connection between relevance realization and sacredness, I'll give you some tools to go back to our original thing, mm -hmm. uh, for thinking about the relationship between quality and at least sacredness. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that will act as a mediation between quality and God. That's what yeah, I'm trying Yeah, I think that that's really, that's really helpful. I think okay. that actually maybe that is even, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for that in the, in the um, let's just say in the spiritual sense. Um, also, you know, the practices to get you there. Exactly, very much. Because, and that's what you're doing, you know, it's like going you, independent of, of, of the relevance, you know, the understanding relevance, realization, understanding quality, everything else. Then you have to enact it in the real world. And how are you going to totally. do that? And it does require you conceptualizing things, you know. It does, it does. You know, and there's no choice. And, and, and this is something I, I like also about what you said. I'm, I'm going off in a direction and I want to go back to relevance, realization. <laughs> we we but want to say. <laughs> but you said, um, you said something like you cannot... Um, you cannot have a theory, you can have a theory of relevance realization, but you cannot have a relevance. And that's a really big thing, yes. But I think that's what Buddhism's all about too. I mean, here's yeah. all the practices, here's the, you know, four noble, in, yes, the four much. ennobling provocations, <laughs> <laughs> and here's the eightfold path. But the actual thing is just the best metaphor, the finger pointing to the moon. Yeah, and, and it's also the beginning of the Tao Te Chen. The way that can be spoken of is not, not the, the way, way. right? Yeah. right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that he stops writing the Tao Te Chen. Uh, well, he writes right? 88 um, poems yeah, yeah. or whatever, yeah. it is, and you yeah. have to, or 81. And you have to, because how are you going to, there's no other way you're going to, um, you know, take the analogs of the entire sum total of human knowledge and your history and your biology and everything else and and use it i mean there's there's otherwise you just go back to a prime you know not the not the primordial state of that uh that we're you know we're speaking of in terms of the the, the experience but right. you're really going back to primordial state i mean this is where we are we have evolved to this and we have to use all that in the yes. world to do the practices and to understand it and then it requires conceptualization that's excellent if you'll allow me, uh, let's talk about the distinction between relevance and relevance realization yeah. as a way of getting into relevance realization and quality, because I think the stuff we're saying here is already relevant to coin a word uh, <laughs> to that discussion. <laughs> but I think it also feeds from what we were just talking about, because one of the things I argue, and so this is an argument, mm -hmm. I'm not claiming that, you know, it, it's the truth. It's something I'm proposing via argument is I think it's a category mistake to understand the sacred, the source of sacredness, as any final fixed thing, precisely because there is no final fixed definition of relevance. Mm -hmm. So, and here's my issue. I understand and I acknowledge thoroughly, and because this is clear in many of the mystics I read, right, that that's not how many people, at least how the mystical tradition has understood God within Christianity and Judaism and Islam. I get that, but I see in a lot of classical theism, theism and theology, God is some, I mean, this was Heidegger's critique of what he called ontotheology. God is the supreme being. Yeah. God is a thing in which, right, to which, that is permanently and absolutely and always relevant. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, I regard that as a category mistake. What I see in things like Taoism and Bo the Buddhist notion of shunyata is no, no, right? the source of sacredness, the sacred, is something that is inherently not a thing. Mm -hmm. It has a no-thingness. It is constantly beyond, uh, right, any kind of objectification, any kind of understanding of it as a being. And so I think the, the, the two mistakes that we need to sort of uncouple at the same time, and I know people will disagree with me on this. I'm stating that right up ahead, mm -hmm. right, is we need to, we, we need to, distinguish a theory of relevance realization from a theory of relevance. Mm -hmm. And then that means that we should understand the sacred, the source of sacredness, not as something that gives us a final definition of relevance. Mm -hmm. That's, those are a conjoined thing that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make an argument for. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think that I see Persig doing that with his notion of quality yeah. as well. Um, that he's not, I mean, he's careful. I, I, like he'll say the Buddha or, or but, but he'll often say Buddha or the Godhead, mm -hmm. not God. He'll say, well, what I've read yeah. so far, he'll say the Godhead, mm -hmm. which is from Eckhart, right? Because, and Eckhart famously prayed, you know, you know, Lord, you know, I pray to God to free us from God, right? That the, right. the, the, the notion the of- conception. The conception, and, yeah. and not just the conception, I get, well, maybe that's what you mean by conception. I mean the whole way of framing the experience of sacredness in terms of a supreme or ultimate yeah. being or be, thing. Yeah, 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 a thing. So, yeah. so getting the thingness out of it yes. while maintaining the divinity. Well, that's what I'm trying to do with the word sacred, because the yeah. thing about divinity, I understand why people are using yeah. it. But the problem for me is I think divinity has too long of a history of being enmeshed with the idea of beings that possess some sort of supernatural source. Right. Something right. in our something in our let's just say collective unconscious that goes back to a time where we believed in gods. Something say. like that, yes. Yeah. And, and and again, I'm gonna say this again, uh, mm -hmm. right? I'm aware of people like Eckhart mm -hmm. and Dionysus and, and Maximus and uh, you know John Scott is Regina, right? The who you know you know mm -hmm. the God beyond God, the Godhead yeah. beyond God, and, and, and all of that. In fact, I'm gonna I'm I'm in the, I'm in the process of starting to produce a series that's going to be called the God Beyond God, like reinventing the sacred for the modern oh, era. That, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. So because I I think this question is a crucial question. So it's, maybe part of the problem is that because it is so embedded in our collective unconscious, divinity is really hard to you know it's it's the sticking point. Right, right, yeah. and so I, I agree. Yeah. And so I, I hope you don't think I'm being dismissive of the people I'm challenging. I, I respect what they're what what they're doing, but I do also take very seriously, you know, the Heideggerian critique mm -hmm. that it's a fundamental mistake to understand the ground of being as a supreme being. Mm -hmm. That's what he calls ontotheology. And yeah. what he means by that is it's not just a way of thinking about God; it's a way of thinking about being. Yeah fundamentally mistaken. It's a way of thinking that what I what relevance realization is, is the detection of relevance. And that's not what it is. And that's what I wanted to ask you. So mm -hmm. like, what do you what, what do you think about my proposal that relevance realization is this dynamic transjective thing analogous to evolution? Yeah. Is I that love, yeah, I, I love the word transjective. I think that's a fabulous word to describe okay. it. I'm, I really, really like that a lot on many levels. Um, but, but okay, let's go to, you know, your last, um, your last uh, number 33. Right. What is really uncanny about that is that pre-intellectual awareness of, qual of yeah. relevance. It I is, thought you'd like that. That's yeah, why I wanted I love that's... that. You know, and that pre-intellectual thing, I think, is, is the key because that means if it's pre-intellectual, then you're not engaging in it at all with the actual moment. It does not engage with um, all that stuff from the past. So in the analogy, my favorite analogy in that book is the boxcars and the train on the track of quality. It's so, it's so apt because it describes the, whole, the totality. So you don't have your boxcars when you feel the, the spark of quality. All you is that feel the cutting quality, edge of the train? Is the that cutting the... edge of the train. But as soon as it's conscience, then those get involved. So it's kind of right. like coupling with the world. Right, right. The actual experience of quality is, is removed from anything except quality. It is that in itself. Let's just say that's kind of like Tao. I think that's yes. the best way to describe it um, in terms of something, you know, in, in terms of trying to, a, a metaphor, because right. it is just, it's this thing that permeates from within and from above it's just it's inherent in everything right 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 so and so anything that you know anytime you're it, it's pre-intellectual so that is exactly like what you were saying about relevance you know relevance yeah, realization yeah. is that yeah. you it and once it's out in the world then the world gets involved and you get involved and that's why it's the cause of subjects and objects not yes. vice versa Yes, that's because right. It's I, not until you you are aware of your yourself and the world that a subject and an object even exists. So here's where here's where I would I would I mean, I think that I think that's really beautiful. I, so I guess what I want to make sure is so is 
because I'm drawing an analogy and I want to make sure I'm getting it right because yeah. you know more about person than I do. I see the cutting edge of the train as like what, what I try to describe with this notion of transframing, where uh -huh. we're going from one frame to another and we're opening up in opening up. Yeah. And, and so and uh, is that is that fair? Is that what what is meant by the cutting edge of the the train? I'm trying to get what like what does that yeah. mean? Um, because it seems to me like what what the cutting edge of the train is 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 that's where I mean he he just he in other places he says the tracks are quality too mm -hmm. which which are in, they 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 make sort of the patterns of intelligibility yeah and, and what they do is like they give us I'm 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 trying to map my my idea of sort of tracking right a trajectory mm -hmm. onto his idea of the, the the train sort of cutting into the unknown and, and, and is that what the cutting edge of the train is. I, I think the cutting edge is not, um, I think quality, you know, is just, uh, this is where it gets a little bit difficult, but quality is something like, what is the next thing that's better? But it can also be bad quality too. It means avoiding bad quality and going for what, what is an improvement. Because if you're transcending, if you're self-transcending, if you're complexifying, yeah, we're just going to say that's better. Okay. okay. Does, does that make sense? That's fair. I mean, I think if it's a complexification that's, like on track to use the metaphor. Yeah, right? a complexification that's on track. Um, the natural progression, the evolution, it's yeah. quality is driving us in that direction. It's driving, let's just say it's the good. The okay. good is what, you know, propels us. It, it has to. Right. Um, it, so, so, the, so quality is both um, the emergence of like, so the, for, let's, he's, you're using Plato's notion of the mm -hmm. good, right? And the good is beyond being. It's not a thing. It's not, it's not any a kind thing. Of... It, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's not a thing. And this is a little bit hard because, you know, the whole, the, the whole uh, premise of quality is that you can't define it like tell. No, and, 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 or like relevance. So, so it's, so it's a real struggle at the, at this point. Let me look um, quickly at uh, a note I made on that. So okay. it's the continuing stimulus which our environment puts upon us to create the world in which we live. Does that oh. make sense? It's a stimulus, but the stimulus well, let, has- let me, let, me, let, me, let me try. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm a cognitive scientist and you're, mm -hmm. using, one of my, you're using one of my terms. <laughs> uh, and so the cognitive revolution is built around the idea that we don't actually respond to stimuli, we respond to the meaning of stimuli. Um, and, and, and so what, but, but here's how I would put it, perhaps, and this is to bring the Platonic notion in. Like, mm -hmm. and it's, it resonates, I hope it's something I said earlier, right? The good comes into my framing as, like I say, as new intelligibility, mm -hmm. new ways of making sense, new ways of finding things relevant, new ways of coordinating uh, my, my, my modal existence. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, uh, that's, I'm trying to use the analogy of the wind on my face yeah. at the cutting edge of the, uh, of the train, right? Yeah. And so the platonic notion is that the good isn't intelligibility. The good is the source of intelligibility, our ability to make yeah. sense, which I take for me over with, it overlaps very much, uh, I think, with relevance realization. Plato has much more going on there, but what I'm trying to say is, is is it the creating of the our, our our desire to create the world in the sense of making a world of meaning? Is that the creativity that's coming there? Because uh, um, there's a sense. Sorry. I'm yeah, talking. I think meaning, intelligibility. I think there's there's a term he uses, which is peace of mind. Okay. So, so what gives you peace of mind is quality. You know. Okay. Well, that's something I then can speak of yeah. because I understand peace of mind ultimately uh, as something like two things that the, there's the optimization of one's inner conflicts uh -huh. right there's inner optimization yeah but that's been joined to meaning in life making being connected to something greater than ourselves right and this is a platonic notion and so what i take peace of mind to be is the kind of things that make people say that their experiences is much more meaningful here's my here's what i'm proposing to you Sevilla. Okay. That, pe that people in the worst circumstances can find peace of mind mm -hmm. in it and this is what i think frankel was yes. on about right is if they can bring intelligibility to it yeah. but not the not just theoretical no frankel's idea is existential and that's what what i'm, I'm trying to get at right what they what they what they what what they're doing is they, if they can 
let, well, let, let's look at the dimensions of meaning of life. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of coherence? Mm -hmm. Is there a depth, a significance? Yes. And is there a sense of direction? Is, is it feel like it's going, right? If it's moving. Yeah. Right? And so that they're not stagnating. And, and so that's what I'm proposing to you, that, that, yeah. that what, what, what's going on when Prisik is talking about this, I think, is people are getting a kind of, they're getting a set of in practices, an ecology of practices, to use one of my phrases, that, and these are conjoined, in a conjoined fashion, are bringing about coherence, depth, direction in a way that is not just external but is also bringing about a coherence a depth and a direction in their inner life and mm -hmm. those are in resonant with each other and they can be doing that and that's frankel's whole argument yeah. even in the midst even the worst situation so is yeah. that is that a fair portrayal yeah and i think that's really helpful because you know this is where you can see this is where i'm getting tripped up i mean if right. i'm trying to articulate this in the world and use it in the world you know, without being able to, and because you can't define quality, but you do have to point, it, you have to point to the moon somehow. So yeah. I think the word intelligibility is really useful because if you're talking about peace of mind, let's just put, use Frankel as an example. Here is in a horrible situation by any, you know, any irrational understanding. Right. But in there is something, in there right. is some way of looking at it. And the thing that gives him the most peace of mind, the thing that's most intelligible, the thing that is, is best for him and the people there and you know everything they're doing in the moment, it's going to feel, let's go back to the way you and I were talking about how do we feel this connectedness. Yes, yes, So yes. what is the thing, I mean, and I hate to use the word thing, but what, how can you, you know, yeah, yeah. what evokes that, piece in you of all these possible all these combinatorially yes. explosive that's right. options and yes, that exactly. thing that brings you the most peace let's just say the most connected and and i'm using peace you know in this kind of weird way too because we're talking about something that is free of blocking yeah. not not free of engagement in the flow state not that that challenge that you feel in the flow state because that challenge is part of Yes, you know, much. part of that. Where, like you said, how do these three things line up? I think that's a great way of putting it. Right. What is bringing that sensibility to you? That's that that that's you, helpful that's, to me to understand. Yeah. So that then means that, right? Uh, so 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 Plato has the good, mm -hmm. right? And then it comes into our framing as intelligibility yeah. as the patterns of the idos or the logos. And you yeah. see this very clearly in Plotinus, right? But you don't ever identify them, right? Because the good is the inexhaustible source yeah. of what we've been talking about, the intelligibility that brings peace of mind mm -hmm. in Persic sense, the, the sense we've tried to deepen here. Yeah. And so that's what I meant when I said to you in one of my comments, I see his structure as very sort of Neoplatonic mm -hmm. in, in nature. There's, there's, right, there's, there's that which cannot be spoken of that then makes that which can be spoken of when, we, when we're articulating these structures. We don't ever identify them, but they have a deep kind of, mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of relationship to each other. Yeah. Is, 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 that, is that fair too? Is that? Yeah, I, I, I think so because, um, yeah, it's the feeling tone of that, let's just say. You know, uh, so if we broaden feeling tone to mean not just what people now mean by the word of feeling, which is a physiological response. Yeah. It, this is a full, you know, full. existential, yeah. cognitive, Absolutely. It involves every, every type of knowing. Right. And Good. it lines up, okay, I got a word, harmony. Right, 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 yeah, right. You feel that harmony. Right. And that's right. like that whole thing. I don't know if you were able to get to the point of Poincaré uh, seeing the harmony in the mathematical. Fact. Well, I, 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 I understood it because I watched one of your videos on it. Uh, so I, I got the point. Yeah. And, and so that's what I mean by patterns of intelligibility that are not just objects of thought, but yeah. that come to inhere in us, yes. connect us to the world in this anagogic fashion. That's what I'm trying to talk I about. Think that, I think that's totally fair. Yeah, I think that sounds oh. absolutely right. I think that's a really good way of putting so it. So that sounds like there's deep, uh, deep connections or yeah. perhaps similarities between what I'm talking about with relevance, realization, and sacredness, and what he's talking about uh, with quality and how it's sort of directed towards the good. Mm -hmm. That sounds all very, uh, very consonant. Very, well, very I think I think I think so, and I think that you know once you once you happen upon the patterns of reality, things really line up like that. 
mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's what's happening. I think that, you know, like, like your work is a, um, would you say it's a, uh, you know, it's a, cog- it's a, it's a cognitive science exploration of this phenomenon. This yeah, I think this so. This eternal phenomenon, this eternal with, pattern. With, with, with uh, yes, with, the conjoined project of trying to do cognitive engineering of sets of psychotechnologies yes. that will <laughs> and allow then, us yeah. to respond to it. But those are those yeah. are always mutually constraining and informing each other. Both mm-hmm. those projects. So so then this brings up the question that um, I wanted to ask you because yeah. there seems to be so much consonance that I'm taking you mm-hmm. as the stand-in for Persig, and I want I should acknowledge that in some deep ways then um, he is an important forerunner of the project. Uh, that I'm investigating, given what we've discussed yeah. today. Yeah, so probably. right now, I want to publicly do that. I want to acknowledge mm-hmm. that Persig is, in, mo- in that sense, a prophet of the meaning crisis, yeah, and even true. of some of the of the machinery, yeah. if you'll allow me that term, that I've been talking about. So, you know, I want to acknowledge his precedence. Mm-hmm. I want to acknowledge that right here, right now, publicly. I think that's important. Because um, I, 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 it's important for me, as you know, to give due credit to people and bring them the proper recognition for their no, work. I've noticed that you're really great about getting, giving credit to people. It's really so I want, I, very I admirable. To, so I want to do that right now, and I mean it, and it's, it's sincere. But given what we've all said, and given, given the consonants, and given my acknowledgement, I don't understand, but you know, I haven't read it as deeply as you are, yeah. so I, I'm quite willing to be put back. And on. I'm not an expert either. I mean, this is something that you can devote years of study to. Right, but I, I'm going to take you as at least an existential <laughs> expert because okay. you're doing more than you're trying to understand the text. You are trying to translate it into a quality existence. Yeah, and I have a deep connection to it. You know, and I feel kind of guided by him. It's, let's just say, um, you know, you were talking about uh, emulating a sage, or of course, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so he's the, he's my my sage. Um, That's good. So, so given all of that resonance, and given, like I said mm-hmm. earlier, he, he, his presentation of it is ultimately platonic, mm-hmm. even in manner. He's using a dramatic dialogue in, in order to present his ideas. I don't understand some of the antipathy I see in section four oh. towards Plato and Socrates. That, that and okay. and and you had sometimes also uh, criticize reason, uh, and there's yeah. some critique of that, and and that. I'll, let's talk about that. Because okay, well, you sent me a question. Should I read it? Yes, please. Yeah, let's please. do that. Okay, so the question was, um, let me get to it because I've got combinatorially explosive notes. <laughs> <laughs> that would sort of mean that they're, they're definitely not good notes then, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much good stuff. I couldn't, you know, I got, I got, uh, right. all right, so um, I'm interested in Pierce's attitude towards reason. I see myself as arguing for expanding the notion of rationality to mean any reliable and systematic practice for overcoming self-deception. This is closer to the ancient meaning and brings it closer to wisdom, as was the case for Plato, for example. Given this notion, then practices as, such as vipassana are rational since they are systematic and reliable attempts to overcoming self-deception. I agree that the modern notion of rationality as a logical supervision of propositional knowledge is too meager a conception. It's just one instance of a family of practices that people need to coordinate in an ecology. I wonder how you think Pearson would respond to this move on my part. Okay, for, so the first thing I see right off the bat is that um, it is one instance of a family of practices. Mm-hmm. I think Pearson thinks that this type of rationality, he's going to call it objective rationality. Right. You know, it's, okay. it's like um, he's going to say that uh, objectivism is the old view of rationality, the Newtonian view of rationality. The, mm-hmm. the, and, and what he says is that. Um, is that that's useful, it's, but it's a tool. It's subservient. Uh, it's subservient to quality. So he felt that there was a new, um, let's just say, spiritual rationality, okay. which in which reason was not meant to be value free. It needs to be subordinate to quality. It's never value free. Yeah, that, it, because, that's but, but that's and I think that that's when I said materialism. I was talking about that Stephen Pinker. I love that Jonathan Pasha. Stephen. That Pinker. was brilliant. That, that was, was brilliant. I love that. that. And we we always refer back to that because he's encapsulated it so well. I, I put a comment in there about to the effect that I think that. Uh, Jonathan could extend the argument into Fodor's critique of uh, Pinker's notion of reason, 
Mm -hmm. uh, Fodor ha in his book, uh, The Mind Doesn't Work That Way, uh, which is a, you know, uh, a criticism of Pinker's How the Mind Works, mm -hmm. is a deep critique of the kind of purely computational view of reason yeah. that Pinker has. Yeah. And, and so uh, even as a cognitive scientist, I think Pinker has a really truncated notion Speaking as a cognitive scientist, I think he has a truncated notion of reason. That's why I'm trying to bring in that reason is always directed towards, it's not value free because it's, it's, it's bound up with relevance realization mm -hmm. and therefore it's always bound up with the attempt to overcome self-deception. Yeah, I, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And so, so what Persig says is that reason, you know, it has to, it has to be subser subservient to quality. It has to have, value has to be, Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it has to be informed by value, by the good. Um, and but that, I, I mean... Well, let's not say, I mean, yeah, I, I, again, I'm kind of... I'm no, kind no, 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 I, I didn't disagree with what you're saying. Uh -huh. What I want to say is, I think that's prescient because a lot of even academic philosophy on the nature of rationality has come to acknowledge that the idea that reasoning is value-free um, uh, well, first of all, it never was value free because it was supposed to at least be bound by the normativity of truth. Yeah. But then as I've tried to argue and other people have done analogous and overlapping arguments, it's also bound by the normativity of relevance. We don't just yeah. see any truth no. and, and we're not even doing that in science. We're seeking truth that, you know, gives us enhanced intelligibility right. and that ultimately has to overlap with our pragmatic projects of, uh, of being in the world. And that's, uh, so I agree with all of that very deeply. I just think that that gets us back to the kind of the way Plato, I think, understood rationality uh, uh, as this much more comprehensive attempt uh, to overcome well, self-deception. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's one part even in there. Well, um, uh, there's well, let me let me read this one part and then I, then I want to go back to um, to that. Okay, please. So, so he said, I guess, this is a quote, I guess what I'm trying to say is the solution to the problem isn't that you abandon rationality, but you expand the nature of rationality so it's capable of coming up with a solution. Oh, because, that's excellent. Yeah, the class, that classic pattern of rationality can be trend, uh, tremendously improved, expanded, and made far more effective through the formal recognition of quality in its operation. Okay, well then I'm, I'm completely in agreement with yeah. that. Yeah, and ob objectivity is, the problem is believing, you know, and I think the, the, the problem with the word truth is you start to believe, and, and I think that that's his trajectory from, you know, the, the Gorgias dialogue all the way down yeah. to Newton, yeah. is that um, there becomes, through that trajectory, through that, um, a notion that you can reduce truth to objectivity. Right, so, so that's why I try to, again, um, maybe it's subversive uh, of the grammar, because I try to say that the rationality extends to all the kinds of knowing, mm -hmm. and that all the kinds of knowing have different normativities for realness. Yeah. That propositional knowing talks about truth, mm -hmm. is kind of a correctness, and you can see this distinction in, Heide I'm gonna talk about this later in this series, Heidegger's uh, von Besen der Wahrheit, the essence of truth, that mm -hmm. tr propositional truth, truth as correspondence, Right, which is the kind of truth you know, Persik is crit criticizing. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately dependent on a deeper, what he calls aletheia, the attunement between the person and the world that isn't captured propositionally, right? Yeah, yeah I think that, yeah. And, and, so that, was, and that attunement is, is the rationality you're talking about. Like to right. And so, and so if you sort of go through the kinds of knowing, you know, procedural knowing, the way it, 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 it the way it grasps or connects to realness mm -hmm. is through the experience of power. Yeah. Which is not the same thing as the experience of truth, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and our perspectival knowing, and, and, and man, does this ever, is this ever clear now as we're getting into virtual realities? Mm -hmm. you know, perspectival, yeah, right. <laughs> perspectival knowing, right? Perspectival knowing is realness comes in as presence. Uh -huh. uh, this experience of you as present to me right now is what's making this real for me, right? So there's presence in mm -hmm. the and then ultimately for the participatory knowing, there's this attunement that makes the agent arena relationship possible, this aletheia. And I think all of those yeah. are, are, are ways in which we should understand realness and that rationality should encompass all of those normativities in a coordinated manner. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I'm arguing. And that to me gets much closer to what we meant all along and what yeah. I think Plato meant by wisdom. Yeah.
and and there is one part in there I, I can't I can't remember where it is but he says you he, he actually gives um, he actually gives some credit to the ancient Greece for, Greeks for that old type of rationality because yeah, he says right. he says this is you know in the moment uh, finding coherence no matter what's going on kind of like finding meaning yes very much very yeah. much and also I think um, you know I definitely uh, okay so in terms of that um, the, that question I think that that's that he would say that um, that yes, you need to restructure rationality away from the objective and to this uh, this this rationality that um, where you are looking for this, you know, where where your object objective, where where you're looking for is that peace of mind, is quality. You're letting quality inform you, and then you use your thinking functions, your rationality, your ability to make coherence in the world so, in yeah. the service of quality rather than the service of objective truth. I think basically is what it is. Okay, that's really helpful. So, is there? Is there then like a dialogue? What I mean by that is one of the things, and you would know this as a therapist better than I, is you don't want people self-deceived about their peace of mind, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want them- Spiritual bypassing. Yeah, and all yeah, kinds yeah, of ways yeah. in which people, uh, escapism yeah. and, and pretense, yeah. and all kinds of ways in which they sort of reduce anxiety, right? There has to be a way what I'm saying, it sounds to me like there's also an important role that rationality, as we've now expanded it, yeah. has with respect to quality, because the, it seems like part of the job of rationality is to get me to distinguish real peace of mind, mm -hmm. notice the real, yeah. from all the earth sex things that are enmeshed with self-deception. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay. and, be, and you've got, you know, a whole population. In fact, I see a lot of younger people in that really the, the virtual world. And I love that what you said about the virtual world, yes, yep. where you can go into a world and you have the three orders. Yep, and so it much. seems absolutely real and you operate in the world as a real because it has the, you know, it has some, it has a pattern in there that is yep. the pattern of reality. And it's, it's kind of, I guess you would say, um, I don't want to say it's tragic because then we go into, well, we just need to get rid of it. And then, then that's not what I mean, but there no, needs no, to be restructuring of, of our, um, of our relationship with technology. We, we, we need a better existential and psychological and cognitive understanding of engagement. And this is work I'm doing with my, my dear friend and uh, my colleague, he's at the mm -hmm. University of California, Dan Chiappi. We're doing a lot of work right now in trying to get a cognitive scientific account of the phenomenology that's going on in these virtual worlds. We're actually engaged yeah. in a project of trying to understand the scientists who use rovers on Mars, you know, and how, mm -hmm. because they get this experience where they come to feel like they're on Mars and that they're seeing through the rover and they're somehow present on Mars. And what's important is, right, there, there's a significant time lag between, like, so you're not, they're not joysticking, they're getting yeah. these pictures and then they're doing all this image processing and discussing with each other and what, and they'll act, they'll act out the rover, they'll say like, <laughs> I, here I am and then and, and they'll identify, we need to go there when they're talking about their, and they do all this perspectival and participatory uh -huh. symbolic stuff, right? And then they get a sense of being on Mars and they actually look for that. They look for people who are capable of getting a sense of being on Mars. And so Dan and I are really trying to get at what's going on because this is a really great test case. Eh? Mm -hmm. How is it that, that, pe that in, in this really you know, distant, temporally disjointed way, nevertheless, they're getting this sense of presence. And it's, and it's yeah. not just an ornamental sense. It actually facilitates their performance as scientists. And so we're really, I'm really, I'm really intrigued by that question about like what's what's in the, the virtual world that's making that possible. Yeah. And when when and when uh, and what happens when it's absent, and what are the yeah. conditions under which it's present and absent. The, so I, I don't have anything uh, definitive to say right now, but I'm just <laughs> well, saying. Well, it's it's a very new thing. It's a very new thing. Yeah. Uh, one of my students uh, wrote. Uh, Gary, uh, oh, I can't remember his last name. I'm sorry, Gary. Um, he he recently wrote um, uh, a piece. I, I don't think it's a complete answer, but he said part of what makes presence in, well, he's made a distinction between presence and emergence. I'm not, mm -hmm. I have questions about that, but let's put that aside. He thinks that the capacity to get into the flow state is one of the things that's often conducive about a sense, a sense of presence. In, in, in. And I bring that up for an important reason, mm -hmm. Sibylla, right? Because it goes again with the play between presence and truth, or at least verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a virtual game or world 
that has a lot of verisimilitude and in that sense yeah. is very truthful yeah, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't give presence yeah. because p- people can't yeah. get into the flow state. And then you get something like Tetris that is not- Oh yeah, that you can get in the flow state with that. <laughs> and they feel presence, right? So you should, this is what I mean. You, uh-huh. gotta, you gotta see that these are not identical things. They're not, they're obviously related, yeah. But you know, verisimilitude and the correctness of our representation yeah. is not the same thing as presence. And that's what exploring the phenomenology of the virtual world is yeah. really bringing out. Really yeah, and I think that's, su- that's such important work because we have to, I mean, I, in your last Q&A at the end, you said, you know, you know what you said at the beginning of this is it's going to make uh, Darwinism look like a cakewalk. Or, yes. You know, yeah. And, and I, th- I think you're right. And I, th- I think that one of the reasons, in fact, that I was even interested in this project at all is because I feel that impending uh, shift, Mm -hmm. you know, and And I, and I think we will go through a cyborg stage. I think that's an, because as I keep saying, we are Andy Clark, we are natural born cyborgs other than your naked body. So I didn't mean to be graphic uh, and the atmosphere (laughs) in your room, everything else is a tool. Yeah, that's right. And so why do these need to be low quality tools? Why can't they be high quality? Well, exactly. So the, the, and and that's where the important thing is. I think so. And so this, and I think the project of bringing wisdom to the technology and the way we're inevitably going to cyborg with it. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the crucial tasks. And I think the wisdom project, and I've tried to argue Mm -hmm. this, is inherently bound up with the meaning making project. Uh, that's the idea yeah. I get from Socrates. The unexamined <laughs> life is not worth living, yeah. right? Uh, and so that, right, that for me uh, is how these are all bound together. The response to this looming, you know, this advent of mm-hmm. AI and the inevitable way in which we're gonna cyborg with it and look at me with things stuck into mm-hmm. my ears, right? And <laughs> we're gonna have chips and yeah. right, you know, this is all coming. Yeah. And if you think it's not coming, it, you. you you're wrong and and so many people are so i I mean i feel like this is something that people are avoiding i think they're avoiding and that reminded me uh of john and sylvia exactly you know and and technology and you you can't you know you can't avoid it you have to you have to get out its ontology. You have to get at the ontology that's underneath it, as Heidegger would say, and you have to get at how we're existentially bound with that ontology. Mm-hmm. And then it's only by transforming the ontology and transforming our being in the world that we can craft a deep response to that in which we could potentially preserve our humanity throughout yeah. this tremendous challenge. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely, because you can easily fall, you know, the whole the whole project can fall into self-deception. You know, it's funny, like the, the patterns that you, um, that you have described can, it's not just us, it's culture, it's everything. You Very know, much. The same pattern can go, can, you know, can uh, go into the self-deception loop. Um, Pearson called it a, uh, a cultural immune system where you get caught up behind this wall oh, yeah. and there's no quality yeah. coming in. You know, That's true you, like you, you said, positive input. Yes, that's Jordan Hall's work, what you just described. That's why the discussions I'm having with Jordan are so enriching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, yeah, yeah just, I saw one the other day, a, yeah, it's, a part of it. Well, it's not, yeah, sorry, I spoke over you. I didn't oh, no, no, no. So, uh, it's, and it's not just, I mean, he's talking about that and he's yeah. trying to, right, he's trying to create, um, he's trying to create a, 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 a way of accessing collective intelligence, uh-huh. like distributed cognition, uh, mm-hmm. to give us the capacity to bring about a co- what he calls coherence, which is really consonant with everything we're talking about here. Because like, like you said, he sees this not just as, a, as patterns in our minds, he sees it, he calls it like a code by yeah. which our culture is unfolding. And he's trying to craft, and that's why you have to pay attention when you're talking with Jordan, not just to what he's saying, Jordan Hall, yeah. but he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole manner. Mm-hmm. It's this manner of trying to get this open-endedness, get this real dialogic thing happening so that we access distributed cognition. We bring our best machinery to bear on exactly uh-huh. the breaking the code that you're talking about here. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So I, re- I, I recommend like taking a look at his work. I, I think, definitely will now, definitely. I, I think... Uh, 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 he had he, he's had a huge influence on me so in our second discussion mm-hmm. he had this insight uh where he talked about 
he talked about that uh, what he's what he's looking for is a meta psychotechnology, a psychotechnology <laughs> that we craft collectively for how we cultivate and coordinate our other psychotechnologies. And I thought that was bloody brilliant. Yeah, it it, it sounds. And then that and makes so, sense. What, so what I'm doing, I'm working on another series. So I'm working. There's two series I'm working on: the 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 God Beyond All, the mm -hmm. God Beyond God, and uh, me and Beyond God. Right? Yeah. And then the other one is called After Socrates, right? The Pursuit of Authentic Dialogue. And what I'm trying to get at is I want to go back to the Platonic, right, encounter with, right, with Socrates and the Enlenkos and, and then Plato trying to capture that with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And there's all this great work uh, uh, by Gonzalez and uh, Abo Rappe and, uh, and, and, and uh, Drew, Drew Highland on, on, on all of this stuff and, and trying to get back like what was deeply going on in Socratic and Lincoln and Socratic dialogue, and then put that into, if you'll allow me, dialogue with all these people like Jordan Hall mm -hmm. or the stuff that I did, the stuff I see in Guy uh, Senstock's work. You know, he invented this whole practice of circling, and I've done circling, and it's a yeah. profound thing. And and the thing people don't know, and I, I really, and he he, and I, I want to keep advertising this. That his his inspiration. I mean, he 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 was involved with Integral and Ken Wilber, but his inspiration for circling was Heidegger. He is trying oh. to bring out this you know this notion we were talking about about Alatheia, this this deep kind of realness, connectedness to realness that mm -hmm. underwrites the propositional stuff. That's what the circling is about. It's about a psychotechnology that we do in a dialogue manner for trying to give us access to Alethea yeah. in a way that is existentially relevant to us, that even gives us, you know, because I see it when I, when yeah. I, the circling or when I read the literature, these people invoke language of sacredness. Because there's, and, and I understand why, because it's a very profound state. You get into kind of this collective flow state mm -hmm. and, and the fount of intelligibility is just bursting forth, and yet, and, but it's resonating. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's resonating with people almost in a therapeutic, transformative mm -hmm. fashion. And it's. Oh. Just, wow. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look into that. That might be what I'm looking for. But, hey, uh, well, and it, and it also, it's going to. It has to engage you physiologically too, biologically, oh, very and much. That's because a lot of these patterns come, you know, like another oh, no, analog. No. Another anal analog for these patterns is going to be biological. Totally, totally. I think that's brilliant. What you just said. So one of the things you're doing, and you might want to see it. Even I had a discussion with Guy, uh, and he. What he did, what he's trying to do with this, with his, uh, with with his channel, right? And oh, well, that was such a that was such a profound experience too, right? Because what he does is we 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 start in dialogue very much like what you and I are doing, and then he weaves it into something like circling uh, between the two of us, and it was just an incredible uh, experience. And what's happening? One of the things you have to bring into the circling is a deep mindfulness of your embodiment and how your body yeah. is often signaling to you in ways that your your intellect has not yet recognized or acknowledged. Absolutely. That's, and that, that's part of it. That's deeply that, part that's of it. That's really practice. interesting because that sort of plays into, and I don't know uh, Lila very well, you know, the metaphysical okay. quality itself. But I mean, I've, you know, it, it, you, you can study these things forever. But, <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what makes them but, but that's great because that's what yeah. makes them sacred, right? The yeah, well, that, that's a very good point. That's because yeah. you can go, because yeah. this, is, this, this is what I'm going to argue for. Yeah. I'm going to argue for instead of the sacred as a fixed thing, right? Plato is sacred to me, not because he's absolute, but because when I, I get something from Plato, it transforms me. I yeah. go out and live my life, I connect, and then I come back and I see something new in Plato that I hadn't seen before that transforms yeah. me again. And so he becomes an enacted symbol in Jonathan's sense of the word symbol. Yeah right for me right tapping into the inexhaustible as an ongoing fount of intelligibility that's, that's what that's right and yeah and that that's how you define sacred absolutely yeah. and i think that that when you said that i don't remember when it was but when i heard you say that i said oh you know all right <laughs> it's time for plato <laughs> <laughs> well I, i'm not saying that plato will be sacred for everybody but it's... but i'm saying that you know that, that that made me think because it's sort of been in the wings you know how things sort of you know yeah, oh, yeah. i should i should do that oh yeah i should read that and then oh yeah i should read the feeders dialogue which i haven't read and then okay, um <laughs> and but that dialogue. when you made that statement i was thinking okay that's it 
that's next. <laughs> the Phaedrus dialogue is a dialogue dedicated to the deep interconnections between rationality and a self-transcendence mm -hmm. that gives you the vision of the good. That's what the dialogue's all about. Um, uh, but I, I, I derailed you. You invoked Lila because you wanted to bring Oh, up because, okay, so in, when you are, uh, that and that, Lila, okay, so Zam is about values. Lila's yes. about morals. It's taking right. the, what's discovered in Zam and creating a, uh, creating a philosophy, let's just say, of morals. A in one a way, way yeah. yeah. And, and so that might be an interesting topic for another discussion in the future sure. because there's yeah. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of parallel there. But one way you inform yourself of quality when you're making a moral decision is what is your, you know, what is your biological yeah. response? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. is yeah. part of the whole package. And, and sometimes again, you can find, you know, the way into truth through your biological response. Yes. I mean, and so, uh, as I'll articulate later, uh, soon, um, you, you know, the, the 4E cognitive science takes embodiment mm -hmm. as a fundamental thing that we've got to deeply incorporate in our understanding yeah. of cognition and sense making. And the work of Evan Thompson, yeah. it, it ultimately, I think, starts with Varela and Jonas, but Evan. Varela, yeah, yeah. But I, but I know Evan Thompson, and mm -hmm. Evan's work is like pivotal on, on all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I used his book when I originally started teaching the course on Buddhism and Cog Sai. That sort of I believe it. Launched. His book on uh, the embodied mind was, mm -hmm. I, I, was, a, it was a pivotal book. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, a, a lot, and you, you, like I say, you, I, I could see this when I'm talking with Guy. I could see it when, when I'm talking with Jordan Hall, that they are, they are, there's always an eye, eye there, there's a stereoscopic vision that they have, but they, there's one eye going down through mm -hmm. procedural and perspectival and participatory. They're, 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 they're activating and access, yeah. and, right, all these deeper levels into their biology, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, your biology is also a way in which you're fitted to your environment. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're, they also have the eye out to the other person. And, and, and they're sort of stereoscopically seeing into you and into themselves and, and and they're and they're creating this sort of vibrant um resonance that is really really part of the grammar of making sense mm -hmm. it's not just the constellation of ideas no. there's resonance and the way it constrains the propositional stuff is playing such a central role such a I central know, that's role. so interesting oh it's uh, yeah, the work it's, is really really fascinating yeah, no. It, this is these are exciting times if you're if you're if you look at them in the right in the quality way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. So this brings me. I mean, given uh, how we invoked it a few minutes ago, uh -huh. this agrees me again to another question. Plato sometimes seems like a villain in Persig, and I'm I, like, it, 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 I, I sense yeah. that there. I acknowledge that he's ambivalent towards mm -hmm. Plato, but in certain places. He, he sort of points to Plato as the place where well, it all went wrong. Well, he right? likes Aristotle even less. <laughs> well, yeah, I, that's fine. <laughs> I, 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 but the thing is, um, these are two these are two sides of him. Yeah. You know, so you've got you've got Pedrus, who is this brilliant uh, person on the track of changing the metaphysics of the Western world, and right. then you have uh, the narrator, who is Persig after the fact, and a lot of the book is the integration of these two personalities. But right. the thing about Phaedrus is Phaedrus is kind of a, he's not exactly a sociopath, but he is so in service of this idea that anything that doesn't he's sort of he, monomaniacal he's, is he monomaniacal is that what i would mean? i would say in a way i mean he's he's directed you know this this i mean he's he's got this thing that it's it's funny it starts out at the beginning of the of the book with this i this under this this problem of combinatorially explosive hypotheses yeah, very much. Yeah, you know, much. and he says, "I how can our, how can this subject object rationality operate if it can only operate within these constraints? You know, you've got right, something right. else going on that just there's a whole lot of unexplained stuff." Right, right. And right. so, uh, so he goes on this quest for the ghost of rationality, and he finds it in that Plato dialogue, the Georges dialogue, right. where where he says that Plato is using um, the tactics of rhetoric itself to diminish quality and, and, and uphold um, truth, something like that. And, uh, but the thing is that the Phaedrus is laser focused. So if he's going to go for anything, he's gonna find that, he's gonna frame it in that way, and he's gonna stick to that. And anything, anything outside of that that doesn't fit 
what he's looking for, which is getting the ghost of rationality, it's not relevant to him. And I so, see. and there's one part in there where the narrator says, you know, he was, he was, <laughs> he was always um, partial and never fair. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Well, I have two things I want to say to that. Yeah. First of all, um, something I'm going to talk about later in the series, um, uh, and which is, uh, so Stang has a book called The Divine Double. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea, um, and, and the reason I'm going to bring it up is because you're going to see it um, in Corbin, you're going to see it in Young, you're going to see it in Tillich explicitly. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also there in, in, in the, the Gnostics, and it's there in the Neoplatonists, and it's there in Pseudo-Dionysus. Um, Stang's work is brilliant. So what the divine double is, this idea, right, is that my true self isn't within me. Uh, my true self is actually beyond me and is beckoning me to, through a process of transcendence. And my relationship to my divine double is how I actually become. And this actually sits very well with a lot of really good philosophical work by, done by Agnes Collard on the notion mm -hmm. of aspiration. We often we often have a relationship to a future self that we are not yet. Remember I talked mm -hmm. about this with transformative experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She talks about, she gives the example of somebody who wants to, wants to love classical music. They currently don't <laughs> music, right? <laughs> so they're trying to do like music appreciation. And she mm -hmm. points out that many of our educational projects are trying to become a person that we currently are not. Mm -hmm. And so, but, and what it means is our, our behavior only makes sense once we become that person. Mm -hmm. So that, that person that we are not yet has a normative authority over us. Now, what I'm, what I'm arguing and what I argue more extensively in the series is we, 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 we symbolize that, again, in Jonathan's sense of a symbol, with the divine double that is out there and is challenging and drawing us into some project. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like Persic is doing a version of the divine double. Uh, with Phaedrus, I mean, he uses yeah. that term for an individual who is, mm -hmm. you know, involved in the project of ascend ascending, ascending, literally yeah, yeah, yeah. ascending to the gods. Mm -hmm. And so, the relationship between Persic and Phaedrus sounds to me like again that aspirational relationship. So that's just deeply intriguing to me. I got to it read. It's really more. interesting because the because he has electroshock therapy, um, and that that creates which Persic does. Yeah. And, and this okay. actually happened. This is almost autobiographical, this book. I mean, it's a novel, and there's a lot of things that are different, but there, it's an autobiographical right. novel. And so Phaedrus was, um, his old self was excised because he, right. he reached this point with, with the end of rationality or, or just understand the, what he believed to be this whole problem in Western philosophy, you know, in the way we, in rationality in Western philosophy that it, it drove him insane. Um, and so he's trying to, Oh, so he's, a, he, he's kind of a dark divine double then. That's right. And he's also like, you know, again, he's, he's laser, laser focused on, the, right. out, on his project. And that means that anything that is not, does, doesn't serve his project is going to go by the wayside. Oh, and right. uh, yeah, and he says, and, and the narrator at one point says, and he was kind of unfair on, on Aristotle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of that is because Phaedrus is, is a laser focused kind of guy. But, um, but it's, it's really, it, it's very interesting because it is the divine double in the sense that, um, and I'm not sure if I'm getting this right, but there's a, there's a quality in Phaedrus that the narrator lacks, you know, due to a lot yeah. of this effective stuff being, you know, it, it, cure, it cured his insanity, but it also made him just a regular guy rather right. than this dynamic, brilliant person. And also what's very interesting as a side note in the narrative is that that dynamic, brilliant person connected better with his son. Ah. So there is a big reason to want to get- So there back. is a project of trying to integrate with Absolutely. faith. Absolutely, that that's and one and of that's the sub-narratives, yeah. And you, that's the Gnostic project. And you can see it mm -hmm. in Young, where the ego has to be mm -hmm. integrated with the self, mm -hmm. which is the divine double. Yeah. Or you can see it yeah. in Tillich, that the existential self has to be integrated with the essential self. Yeah. Like, this is also, this is- Another like, pattern that we're- <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is part of the grammar of aspiration that I'm yeah. trying to- yeah. Okay, so again, he seems to, I mean, I don't, I don't want to dismiss the, the personal suffering in his life and the distress, yeah. but he seems, again, to be sort of really prescient of this and exemplifying it in the book. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's another thing I just want to acknowledge. Yeah. So, so, not, to, so not to put into Persig's mouth, but into, it's clearly in Phaedrus's mouth mm -hmm. that uh, he thinks that Plato's, uh, Plato's critique of the sophists is in some sense unfair. Now, here's why I think this is important. Okay. So let me, 
Let me just yeah, broaden it a little bit. Then I'll, I'll, I'm very I'll, interested in this. Because I see, I see rhetoric, the way I presented it in the, in, in the lecture, I see rhetoric as, as, the, as, the, as the creation, discovery. Uh, the Latin word inventio covers both discovery and invention, so it's a better word. It's the inventio, right, uh, of uh, a psychotechnology mm -hmm. that, a, that works in terms of relevance realization. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, it's all, yes, it's all, yes. It's all, it's all about relevance. Yes. And so I, what, what, what I can hear Phaedra saying and what I'm in agreement with, right, is he's saying as Socrates is attacking, right, as he's attacking the sophists, he's attacking the importance of relevance to realization. Mm -hmm. And relevance realization, as we've discussed, is bound up and overlaps yeah. significantly with quality. With quality, yes. I, I, I see, and I understand that yeah. point. You see, I don't see, I don't see Plato quite doing that. I mean, he's concerned, I think, with, at least I see it this way, that Socrates is very concerned with both truth and, tr and existential relevance. Mm -hmm. He dies because the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. And, and what the work of Gonzalez and other people say is, you have to pay attention to not just what Socrates is saying, but you have to pay attention to the drama and you have to pay attention to the fact that the dialogues propositionally often end inconclusively, mm -hmm. right? Plato isn't making definitive statements. Mm -hmm. What he's trying to do is he's trying, like, so, so for example, you, you take a look at a dialogue. Gonzalez does this really great, uh, I think, in the Lyceus, and there's the two generals talking about courage. Yeah. Okay? And Socrates actually is challenging both of them. Now, one of them, he, he just has this untutored, untutored intuitive understanding of courage. And what Socrates likes about that is how participatory it is, how, how, how much the person, I forget which general it is, is committed to this. But he doesn't like the fact that it's unreflective, it's uncritical, mm -hmm. it's filled with all kinds of self-deception because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just intuitive. So he criticizes that. Then the other general who's deeply influenced by the sophist comes in and, and proposes these, these other definitions, right? And Socrates also is critical of that. In fact, that guy even invokes a line from Socrates' own practice, and then Socrates brings himself into self-criticism, because he's also critical of the fact that this can be had just by making propositions catchy and salient to yeah, us, yeah. which is what he sees the sophists doing. Yeah. He doesn't see how this making propositions mm -hmm salient and catchy is connecting and so he he's actually criticizing both he's he wants the participatory involvement of the intuitive person but he wants the critical right reflection of the person influenced by the sophist mm -hmm. he's proposing something that does the two together and so he so what happens in the dialogue he criticizes both and then he comes to no clear uh, definition of courage precisely because he's trying to show that courage is not something that can be grasped definitionally. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pay attention to the end of the dialogue. Both generals say, even though there's been no proposition about courage, that they want their sons to study with Socrates in order to become more courageous. Socrates is exemplifying in the way he is open in the dialogue, the very courage that cannot be defined propositionally. I see Socrates as criticizing both mm -hmm. of these in a much more complex fashion. And I, 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 so I don't think it's a simple sort of rejection mm -hmm. of, 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 of rhetoric. I, I, I don't think that's fair to the way dialectic, and the yeah. dialectic is not the sort of the, 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 the just the pursuit of the truth. Maybe that's Phaedrus projecting it's Phaedrus. the project. It's Phaedrus ah. with his laser focus. Right, and projecting, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, using your laser analogy, yeah. he's even projecting <laughs> his own mo monomaniacal mm -hmm. sort of pursuit of this. Because dialect, I mean, the, the way the dialogue is resolved isn't in the, pro mm -hmm. in the proposal, the proposition of a truth. It is in the people suddenly finding the need to connect with the example of Socrates existentially. That's where the answer uh, is actually to be found. And so I think that's what's actually going on mm -hmm. in Socratic, Elenchus, and dialectic. And so I don't think Phaedrus is, is being fair to it, um, and, because I think the representation of the contrast with dialectic and rhetoric is 
it, it, it sounds too it, it sounds too simplistic to me. So there's a bit of criticism. <laughs> well, Phaedrus is never fair and always partial. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's good. Uh, but so but you. one thing that I think it but but the thing that does ha emerge though, and this is a lot of what we're talking about, is that wherever it started and however it started, and I think that um, it 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 all it ends up like Phaedrus is saying this trajectory to Newton. And you're saying that it's in Copernicus where you remove all the phenomenological, is that? I think it starts even earlier. I think it starts right after uh, Aquinas. And when you get yeah. the shift in the reading, the pattern of reading, mm -hmm. you, you get the idea, right, that, that knowing is coherence of propositions. You get mm -hmm. Occam's nominalism. Yeah, yeah, that's I, it, that's it. Yeah, I, sorry. I, I, that's, I, that's why I said I was going to be weak on those parts because those are the parts I study. Uh, don't worry about that, Sibylla. But, uh, but I, love, I love them and I'm going to go yeah. back to them. But um, because I think this is just as, as a side note, uh, n not having studied philosophy and wanting to study philosophy, I think coming at it from someone like you who is using it in a whole system makes it much more compelling rather than just going cold into reading things and, and not yeah. being able to, you know, I, I, would, I like doing it better this way, going through someone like you. Well, thank you. I, I, I could recommend somebody else who's had a deep influence on me for this. Uh, if you want to read one book on this, read Pierre Hadot's book, What is Ancient Philosophy? Yeah, yeah. that's been, that's been um, suggested to me before uh, uh, by a view who, because I was interested in you, he said, yeah, you should read that. And today I was looking at my notes and I said, there's that book. I've got to read that. Yeah, so and thank, I, I did that. thank you for reminding me. I, I tweeted about that as one of my book recommendations too. Oh, yeah. I got to get back and do some. You more should book do. Reading. You should do a book list. You should do a reading. Well, I'm doing that. I'm doing that progressively. So I tweet out every few weeks. I, I, I need to do it a little bit more regular. I tweet out a recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend a book, and then I recommend yeah. a book, and I recommend a book. But yeah. yeah, I know you have them after you know in the description section, but like a like a like a whole. Uh, yeah, once the series is done, right. maybe somewhere put it yeah. in the fiftieth episode. Yeah. Uh, it's a book list of everything that was ever uh, discussed. Yeah, yeah. I, need, well, there's, there's I, I promised to do. I promised to do that in one of the recent lectures, and then I I just ran out of time. Yeah, and that happens. Get a chance to do it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I I haven't I haven't I haven't uh, I haven't tried to escape from that responsibility. I will try to get a more comprehensive book list. I'm promising that uh, uh, by the end of the series for people. So I will come back to that. Well, I think there's a whole lot of things that will emerge from that series. I, I hope so, and like I said, go in the practice direction and everything. Well, uh, so in, so I want to do this, like I said, after yeah. Socrates, and I was just doing yeah, it with yeah. you a few minutes ago, uh -huh. right? and then I want to do the God Beyond God. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are going to be like the meaning awakening mm -hmm. through the meaning crisis. Yeah, sort of a series, not as long, but they're going to be a series uh, 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 of lectures building a comprehensive argument. But along the way, I'm also going to do much more of the instructional videos, like uh, some of the ones you know take people through how to do Vipassana. That's a great video. That's, what? that's, one, that's one of the better, best videos I've seen. Um, oh, well, thank you. I, I like that a lot. It's very, it's very clear and it's very, it, and you're explaining why, and that's a, that's a really good one. So I have a 10 week course, I mean, uh -huh. and it won't take 10 weeks. I want to sort of give that, that instruction to people. Yeah. You know, some, you know, here's some basic Qigong type. That would be really useful. Too. Here's how to do active open-mindedness, um, like just a, a bunch of practices, mm -hmm. uh, how to do Lectio Divina, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so there's also going to be instructional videos. So I have, I, ha I have, I, I hope I'm not overly ambitious, but there's a lot of, because of the way these are all mutually interdependent, there's a, there's a lot that's going to come after the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, uh, just trying to develop these lines mm -hmm. in a much more sort of, so the awakening from the it's this comprehensive thing now i yeah. want to be much more context specific yeah uh, so that no, that's that, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense so what do you have any other questions for me i think we've discussed all the issues i wanted addressed uh, um i might have had one last one i wanted to please. uh i think i put it at the end um, one thing that's kind of interesting to me that came up in your work and this i I remember when I was talking with Jonathan, um, I was talking... Isn't he great, isn't he great to talk to? Yes. I, I, yeah. That was wonderful. Yeah. He, he's a great interlocutor. He's so sharp and so <laughs> insightful, and he sees connections like that. It, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's, oh, my gosh. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And um, so, so it was something about... Um, I was talking about um, how at the bottom of, you know, you've, you've got... You've got cohesion, 
I was talking about it, I think, in, in terms of mental health cohesion and fragmentation. Right. Because right, a lot right. of things that happen, you know, uh, like like a trauma, a traumatized person who has very, let's just say, terrible childhood, will be very fragmented in their adult yes. life. You know, like, uh, like um, really will have I, the, at the end of the spectrum, of course, is multiple personality DID. Right. So, so there's like a, a pathology to fragmentation, um, I think. But there, and and then I was talking about that with him, and he said, "Well, well, you know, in this model, in this particular symbol, it's diversification. Uh, I mean, it's like 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 God is within all the all the all the no, 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 particulars yeah. and in the whole." That's and right. then I realized the mistake I was making was fragmentation versus diversification. And then I heard yeah. you say complexity, diversifying complexity. So there's like, although they seem the same. They're not. Yeah, They're no, not. I and I think that the trajectory of, you know, subject object rationality has resulted in a, in fragmentation that yes. is untenable. Yeah. And I, I try to do that. And when I try to argue about even our approach to the mind has fragmented yeah. our ontology of the mind between these different disciplines. I, I totally Exactly. So so it's like like to have diversification is healthy, but to have fragmentation is unhealthy. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. So, I, I, so this this goes towards uh, some of the language I was trying to bring in from cognitive science. So you have to make a distinction between complicated and, and complex, mm -hmm. right? A, a complicated system is, is one that can be solved ultimately sort of algorithmically or step-by-step -step kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Where a complex system is one that has emergent properties. Emerge, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's right, it, it, yeah. it's different in, in that important way. So a, a complex system that in which, um, in which its history and its functionality are, are are enmeshed because emergence is part of how it functions. Yes, yes. Right. So it, 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 it creates emergence functions to deal with emergent situations in the world. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's part of its deep adaptivity. You get that by having something that is simultaneously very integrated and very differentiated. Right. Yeah. And so I try to argue that the machinery of relevance realization is the machinery of complexification because efficiency is driving you towards integration and resiliency is driving you to introducing variation, differentiating your functionality. And so it's inherently a, a self-complexifying uh, process. Yeah, yeah self-complexifying, self-transcending. Yes. And so rather than like with a rational knife, you're just cutting and cutting and cutting. Right. And then you take the little parts and put them together with a synthesis. And there's a deep and there's yeah. a deep there's a deep connection here. And it goes yeah. back, remember I mentioned Jerry Fodor's critique of Pinker. Mm -hmm. uh, so Fodor's idea that you can't reason your way from a weaker logic to a stronger logic because mm -hmm. you actually have to step outside of the system and you have to differentiate. You have to add in new axioms, new functions, and then you reintegrate. Right, so you right, it's, you have to actually complexify and get emergent functions. Mm -hmm. so you, this is why L.A. Paul says you can't sort of infer your way through a transformative experience. You can't actually uh, reason your way in, in the sense of inference from a weaker logic to a, a stronger logic. So that that's what I was saying. The complexification, right, and the self transcendence are just enmeshed in, like I said, this this new the, this deeper sense of rationality. The sense of rationality, and this is what Colleen. Uh, uh, sorry, Agnes Collard argues for in her book, Aspiration. We have to include this ability to transcend ourselves in a way that makes sense after we're finished the aspiration. This is what she calls proleptic rationality, aspirational rationality. That has to be part and parcel of what we now mean by rationality. It doesn't just mean syllogistic mm -hmm. reasoning. Yeah. It doesn't just mean going argumentation from premises to conclusion. That is too, too simplistic. Yes, we, the, the old rationality is a useful tool within this. Right, it's gotta be, it's gotta be set within this broader notion of rationality, a kind of rationality that like Plotinus and Plato brings back self-transcendence and the aspiration mm -hmm. to internalizing the sage that was deeply part of what it meant to be rational. Yes, and quality. Yes, of course, of course, of course, of course. Not, no, I don't want to steal your thought. Not, not at all, not at all. I'm very no, much. it's 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 all part of the it's all part of what we're looking for. I think so. So you got? Did I answer your final question? Did, yes, you, you did. Uh, Thank you. Is there anything yeah. like like I said? First of all, mm -hmm. um, if at some point you have more questions, you'd like to have another discussion. I, I'm I would, I'd love to. I think that there's so much. Uh, there's so much here. 
So I'd be very, very happy and open to doing that again. Thank and, you very much. And and like and I, I think the you have I mean I was already I already had come to this, but you have really persuaded me of the value of this book uh, in terms of what we've discussed and how oh, many I'm things happy. how many things it exemplifies mm -hmm. and how prescient it is and how you know, it, 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 can, it can engage in sort of cri uh, critical dialogue in a, in, 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 through you uh, in an ongoing manner. Uh, so I think, I think the way you're bringing this book into the discussion of the response to the meaning crisis, I think it is important. I think it's an important thing. And I want you to- Oh, I thank you so much. I want to help, and you. I want to help you with you. the project. As much well, as I thank can. you. And I, I just love your work. And like I said, I just, you know, what you're doing is so important. And this is, this is what, you know, we we can determine our future. I think, I, I you know, think by I, by how we approach it, we can do. We can continue down the road we're going, or we can transform this into something that that brings back the things that we're missing. I agree. You know, so it, uh, for me, I um, I'm more hopeful about that than I used to be, precisely because mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people like yourself. Yeah. There's a lot more happening. I still see it as a big race. There's huge forces. Yeah. Economic and political sure. and cultural forces that are at work keeping us going down uh, the, the, the path the, that we're going down right now. Uh, so I, I, I'm hopeful, I think it's a rational hope, I'm not convinced that we're going to steer things right, uh, but, but there's no alternative then to try. There's no, there's no alternative, al all we can do is try. Yeah, very much. So thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this discussion. And like I, I have said, too. Thank uh, you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and, and you know, for, you know, connecting with me and including me in this. I'm just so grateful. You should be included. I mean, thank you, you. Like I said, I think, I mean, I think our discussion today was just a very good argument for the relevance <laughs> of, of Persig's work to this project. I think that's, I think that's yeah. become, I think, I, I hope at least clearer for people that happen to watch this. And, and, and like I've, I've been saying, uh, and I've been encouraged, you know, there's other people, I see it, uh, there's mm -hmm. more, you know, uh, the, the, I don't know the woman yet, but the, she's doing the meaning code and there's Mary Yeah, Clark, yeah, I heard about her, Clark, I, I need to. Clark and to others, um, and Esther Roddy, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I hope this doesn't come off uh, as patronizing, uh, but we need more women in this dialogue, right? Uh, one of the things that, one of the things that needs to be different about mm -hmm. this, that then, you know, in the, you know, there's a real sorry jordan peterson his 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 audience is 95 percent young white male yes. right and 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 that's not where there's the response that we're talking about is going to be found we need yeah. a much more inclusive yeah. culture right yeah, the much response needs to be with every all of us and and yeah i've yeah. talked to i i'd like mary kohan and uh, esther o'reilly a lot that's I've, her I've name sorry a, if i mispronounced yeah. it mary. well it's not it's spelled it's spelled in a way that you wouldn't know she, okay, she okay. told me how to pronounce it. Okay. So yeah, the, no, they're great. And one one thing that was really interesting is when I was just doing piercing, all I was getting was was men, right? Uh, you know, responding to to um, to my my work. But as soon as um, as soon as Paul got involved, that changed because yeah. some of his audience came over. So I'm yeah, I appreciate you know definitely having a lot of voices. Yeah, very much, very much so, and so. And, so for both of those important reasons, both the work you're doing and the viewpoint you bring to that work, uh, the, right? Uh, you, you need to be in, you need to be in this corner, and mm -hmm. you need to be well lit thank within you. the corner. Well, so thank you for <laughs> including me in this corner. I'm very grateful, and I'm appreciative. And thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you very much, Savella. It was a great pleasure for me as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.